tonight we're going to be looking at having material and spiritual values. This is a question we get very uh, prominently all over the world. How do I do it? How do I balance my material and spiritual life? So, Shil Prabhupada says that there's two kinds of activities. There's conditional and constitutional. Some are conditional activities are you know, ordinary things, taking care of the body, taking care of the family, following the rules of the country, and so forth. And Prabhupada says that these apply even for the devotees. It's not that you become a devotee and you don't need to brush your teeth anymore. And then there's the constitutional activities, which are devotional service. Now, sometimes it's a little hard to tell the difference between these, by the way. I'll just sort of say this as, as a little aside. That basically, these activities, these spiritual activities, this is what we're talking about, hearing, chanting, remembering, serving the lotus feet, etc. And when we're talking about the, these activities, we're talking about varna and ashrama. And what varna and ashrama means, varna means how you make your livelihood, how you live. And ashrama means your lifestyle. What are your different duties in the lifestyle? So ashrama means you know, you're a student, and then you're a family, and then you're retired, and then you're preparing for death. And varna means how you make your living when you're with your family. And then all the other things. That. But sometimes it's confusing because there are some things that seem like they can go in both categories. Do you think of something that you, that you could put in either category that you wouldn't really be sure which one of these it was? Anybody give me an example of something that you might not be sure whether it's a, a conditional or a constitutional activity? Charity. Okay, charity is, is a very good example. So I was giving charity something mundane or is it something sweet? If I give charity to a brahmana, is that a mundane activity or is it just a good activity? What's another good example? What's another good example? Some austere. Another example of something that we're not quite sure. Is it conditional or is it constitutional? Yeah. Sacrifice. <coughs> the three from the 18th chapter. Okay. Sacrifice is there in the ancient. Is the idea specifically done by the Brahmins? It could be a Brahmin Varna activity, or it could be an activity in Bhakti. And some other examples. What are some other activities of a Brahmin's Varna that are also a Bhakti activity? Deity worship? study of the scriptures, so those are specifically constitutional activities, but they might also be one's own activities. What would, deter what would determine whether they were constitutional activities or conditional activities? So someone's worshiping the, the deity, are they doing that as part of bhakti? Or are they doing that as a brahmana varna? How would you know? Your intention. So, uh, generally, we try to have these activities run in parallel. So, usually, we try to have the activities for the upkeep of our body, our livelihood, our, our status in life, and our direct bhakti activities running in parallel, being in harmony. And, in fact, the, it's very nice that the Vedic Shastra gives directions for even the material activities. So, they could run in harmony, but Prabhupada says sometimes these things become opposed to one another. So sometimes, in order to do the material activities, it seems we have to sacrifice something spiritual at times. In order to do the spiritual activities, it seems we have to sacrifice something material. So we're going to look at four problems, four different kinds of problems. Now, we're not saying these are the only problems, or we're not even saying these are the only solutions, but we're looking at four problems with balancing our constitutional our spiritual and our conditional or material activities. So one problem 
could be that transcendental absorption seems very hard. I mean, we were talking yesterday about having transcendental absorption while chanting, and a number of people says, well, I can't, I can't think of Krishna when I'm chanting Hare Krishna. So if you can't think of Krishna while you're chanting Hare Krishna, how are you going to think of Krishna while you're driving your car, right? So a lot of times people say, well, how do I think of Krishna at work? I say, first think about Krishna when you're chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Right, so transcendental absorption seems very hard. It seems hard. Mama Nusram Yujicha, how do I think of you, Krishna, and fight? Another problem is that life is seen as separate from service. That we really see, you know, well, these are my spiritual activities and these are my material activities. My material activities don't have anything to do with my spiritual activities. Then pressure for things that are opposed to, to bhakti. Pressure to do, uh, engage in activities that oppose a spiritual lifestyle. And just a lack of time, scheduling problems and priority problems. So we're going to look at each of these now individually. Okay, so first we're going to look at transcendental absorption. So the problems with this is that our work and our life seem to be very material. We, we just think everything I'm doing is material, everything I'm doing is mundane. And I just can't remember Krishna while I'm doing those mundane things. Seeing my life is separate from Krishna. So th this is often related to a problem of thinking I'm supposed to be detached from my material life. You know, I'm not supposed to have any material life. I'm supposed to be detached from material life. And thinking that means you have to be hard-hearted or you have to be irresponsible and just neglect your material life, which can lead to neglecting your family members' emotional needs, uh, neglecting your own emotional, physical, or social needs. I was just talking to a devotee the other day who said, yeah, you know, when I, when I came to Krishna consciousness, I was really fanatical, and I was just neglecting all of my own needs, my own material needs. And uh, this devotee was saying to me, you know, now, 20 years later, those needs are coming out, <laughs> and I'm, I'm having to deal with them. This is a, a very, very common situation. And then pressure for sinful activities... And this pressure can come from other people we work with. It can come from other family members who are not devotees, other students we go to school with. And interestingly enough, it can even come from ourselves. <laughs> so if we've done things in the past that weren't very favorable, uh, we can be our own worst enemy. And then lack of time, lack of scheduling, lack of priorities, you know, staying up really late at night, leaving for work really early. This is a very common thing in modern society. You know, people get home from work at nine at night and they leave for work at six in the morning. Having heavy demands from home, wife, children, mother, father, family members, uh, spending a lot of time with movies and internet and games and so forth. And then just not having much time for concentrated japa and kirtan and study on a regular basis kind of thing. I hear this all the time. And, you know, our life might seem like this. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to look now at some possible solutions. I, I don't pretend that these are the only solutions. I'm hoping that these solutions will spark your own thinking, your own creativity, your own dependence on Krishna. <laughs> uh, and I'm hoping that at least some of these solutions will be helpful to each of you. And maybe you can come up with some of your own. So we're going to look first at how do we think of Krishna always? How do we think of Krishna always? And this is one way that we sort of blur the line between material and spiritual. This, of course, is Krishna's instruction. Mam anusmam yujaja, think of me and fight. Hmm? So there's this wonderful verse in the Bhagavad Gita, 424. Brahmar panam brahma havir brahm agno brahmana hutam brahmaivatena gantavya brahma karma samadina. A person is, who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. So this is talking about everything is absorbed in spirit. The person doing something, what they're doing, to whom they're offering it, every aspect is spiritual. Srila Prabhupada in the purport to this verse, 
make some very astonishing statements. And this is a recurring theme in Srila Prabhupada's instructions, that sarvakalamidam brahma, everything is ultimately spiritual. And when we use matter in the service of the Lord, it regains, he says, it regains its spiritual quality. Krishna consciousness is the process of converting the illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. And he says, anything done in such transcendental consciousness is called yajna. In that condition, the contributor, the contribution, the consumption, the performer, and the result, everything becomes one in the absolute. So what Prabhupada is saying here is when you have the right consciousness, when you have the right consciousness, everything you do is spiritual. Of course, you can't say, well, I'll have the right consciousness and kill cows. <laughs> when you have the right consciousness, there's certain things you don't do. Okay? Those are limited. We only have a few things you don't do when you're in the right consciousness. You know, you don't run a mafia ring and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> manage a slaughterhouse or a brothel or a liquor shop. So there's a few things that when you're in transcendental consciousness, you just don't do at all. And everything else, when you're in transcendental consciousness, becomes spiritual. So how do we get in this transcendental consciousness? This is one of my favorite purports, Bhagavad Gita 12.2, where Prabhupada's saying that when you're thinking of doing everything for Krishna, uh, when you're doing everything for Krishna, then you become in samadhi. Now, this is interesting because generally we think of samadhi in the Astanga Yoga system as your eyes are closed, your ears are closed, right? The stage before samadhi is prachitara, where all the senses are withdrawn from contact with their objects. Something like what you would have in deep sleep. Hmm? This is why we have all these stories in the Bhagavatam of these sages who were in samadhi and somebody came to talk to them and they didn't answer. Right? Like Samakarishi didn't answer with King Prickett. Prickett said, give me water. He was the emperor. He was used to talking like that. And Samakarishi didn't answer. We had a similar situation where Lord Shiva didn't see Daksha. Right? Because they were in samadhi. They were unaware of their situation. So how could you be doing all these things Prabhupada's talking about? Could you be driving your car to the marketplace in that kind of samadhi? I don't think so. <laughs> so the kind of samadhi that Srila Prabhupada's talking about here is very different. He's talking about a samadhi of love. So this is the kind of samadhi that we all go into whenever we really are attached to someone or something, that we become absorbed. Hmm? Everybody's had this experience? If you've ever been in what we call in love, you know, romantic love, as yes, you become absorbed in that person, I'm sure many of us or all of us have had that experience, where you just can't think of anything else but that boy or that girl, doesn't matter what else you're doing. Or when you first have a baby, right? Those of you who are parents, so when that baby's first born, all you think about is that baby. You don't think about anything else. You wake up in the middle of the night, you know, is he sleeping? Is he breathing? <laughs> If you go in the next room, you know, is he okay? Oh, is he okay in the next room? <laughs> right? Now, so that's a kind of samadhi. It's not that you can't drive a car, and it's not, not that you can't even hold a conversation with someone else, but you're constantly absorbed in thinking about your attachment. And this can even be true, you know, if you're planning a trip to India tomorrow. So you're sitting here in the class, and you're not hearing a word I say because you're just thinking, oh, and i got to pack this, i got to pack that. Gotta... So that's practical samadhi based on attachment which is more valuable than mechanical samadhi. Mechanical samadhi it isn't really that solid. So that's the kind of samadhi that Srila Prabhupada's talking about, where whatever you're doing, you're thinking about Krishna. Anything you're doing, you're thinking about Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada says that if you're, if you're in this consciousness, it doesn't even matter if you're working in a factory. It, doesn't, it just doesn't matter. Again, you're not going to be doing sinful things. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It all, be, everything becomes transcendental or spiritual. All right, how to do this specifically? We've talked right now about the principle and how to do this. So here we turn to the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna tells us how he can be found in the material energy. So if anybody can tell me, what are some of these pictures of? Krishna says, I am Krishna says, I am 
the strength of the strong, yes, or the ability in men. So that's either ability or strength, as you like, or both. And what else does Krishna say? I am the light of the sun, yes, and I am the I am the heat in fire, and I am the I am the a purifier. I am the wind, yes. Flower bearing spring, and I am the taste in water means the taste of all things. Because it is liquid that gives anything its taste. Without liquid, there's no taste. Hmm? So in this way, we can remember Krishna. We have one seminar we give where we go through all the material elements. And we meditate on how we can think of Krishna in all the material elements. So this requires a little bit of practice, a little bit of practice. So let's do right now, I am the heat in fire. Hmm? Everyone's body is warm, I assume. No one's dead here. OK, so there's some heat in your bodies. And there is, is there some heat in the room? Is the room warm? Nobody's cold? All right. So let's, let's meditate on that for a minute. Feel the heat. Notice it. Notice the heat in the room. There's heat on your skin. There's heat in your body. St. So Krishna says, I am the heat in fire. So that's Krishna. And you can meditate on that, just like the warmth. We associate warmth with life, with love. That means we're being surrounded all the time with Krishna as the supreme life, Krishna as the supreme loving person. And of course, we can always be absorbed in Krishna by chanting Hare Krishna. Now, that doesn't mean that you should, you know, stand in the supermarket line having a roaring kirtan. <laughs> but one can always at least chant mentally, right? Or you can like bring a little, one of those little sets of mini sets of beads with you. And you can chant wherever you are. And Prabhupada would often talk about this. You can chant in the train, you can chant in the bus, you can chant uh, while driving. Uh, sometimes everybody say you shouldn't chant while driving, but Prabhupada said he was very happy that Jayananda was chanting while driving. Just putting that out there. So you can chant in any circumstance and remember Krishna in that way. And of course, we can also remember Krishna's form. And Prabhupada specifically says, we talked about this a little bit yesterday with chanting, that Prabhupada specifically says this is one of the purposes of deity worship, that by worshiping the deity, we imprint the form of the Lord in our mind. And then we can remember Krishna's form wherever we are. And again, we all know how to do this, right? I'm sure anybody here can immediately think of the form of someone that they know or love in this world. Is that correct? Right? Everybody can think of the form of their mother or their dog or their whatever. Someone that you love, you can immediately think of. So we can do that with Krishna. And of course, we can also think about Krishna's pastimes. There's one place where Srila Prabhupada says that if you just meditate on one pastime of Krishna, that you could become perfect if you meditate on that over and over and over again. And uh, so many things in the world can remind us of Krishna's pastimes. I mean, after all, everything that happens in this world has its parallel in the spiritual world. You know, just seeing as some mother with her child, we can med remember Mother Yasoda. Seeing some beautifully dressed woman, we can remember how Krishna supplied the sari to Draupadi. Right? Seeing someone who's pregnant, we can remember how Krishna say Parikit in the womb. We seeing somebody dance, we can remember Krishna dancing on Kaliya. Right? I mean, at, at seeing some butter, we can remember how Krishna stole the butter and get so many things. Practically everything in life can be used as the stimulus for us to remember in one of these ways. And you can say, well, I can't do it. It's too hard. But it's just practice. That's why it's called sadhana bhakti. It's a question of making a deliberate attempt to practice. Right? So when we feel the heat in the room, we can remember Krishna's the heat in fire. Or we can remember how Krishna swallowed the fire. Or we can remember how there was the battle between the Shiva Jwara and the Narayana Jwara. We can remember the fire coming out of Kaliya's mouth. In so many ways, just the normal heat in the room from the sun can remind us of Krishna, but we need to make a deliberate attempt to practice. So it can start with, you know, just one time a day. You say, okay, before I eat lunch, I'm going to make an effort to look around and, and be conscious of something that reminds me of Krishna. Before I eat dinner, before I go to bed, before I turn on my computer, every time I look at my phone, or something. 
I'm going to take a second whenever I check my email, whenever I, whatever, I'm going to become conscious of Krishna. And gradually it becomes, a habit becomes part of our life. Okay, we're going to go into the next one. Uh, having this idea, so this is, we first talked about just being conscious of Krishna all the time in our environment. But you can say, all right, I'm conscious of Krishna in my environment, but still it's material. You know, I'm sitting here at work, and okay, I'm thinking about how Krishna is the heat, and I'm thinking about how Krishna is the light, and even maybe I'm remembering the disrobing of Draupadi or something, but my, the, what I'm doing itself seems to be material. There seems to be this real difference between my constitutional and conditional activities, and what am I doing this material activity for? So this is very nice, what Srila Prabhupada says, that until we're completely purified, we cannot give up all work in the world. Hmm? If we just say, well, I'm just going to walk away from everything, and, and we, we've had many times devotees do that kind of thing. They say, well, you know, that's all material stuff. I just won't do any of it. I'll just go live in Vrindavan, or I'll just go live in the ashram, you know, forget about doing anything in the world. But that kind of position is very dangerous. We see that most people cannot maintain that complete renunciation of everything in the world for a very, very long time. And then they may end up falling into much worse activities than if they had tried to use thing in Krishna's service. So the secret to do this is one of these beautiful songs by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And Bhaktivinoda has, has a number of songs in this respect, where he says, nothing further remains that may be called mine declaring that my wealth, family members, home, and wife are truly yours. I continue as a mere servant to dutifully protect them. For the purpose of your service, I will earn money and bear the expense of maintaining your household. So if we think of it just like there are devotees here in the temple, uh, like Aniruddha Prabhu, Nanda Mandir Prabhu, and they have responsible positions, just like Aniruddha Prabhu was talking to us the other day and saying, well, we're thinking of how we want to expand, maybe build another temple. We're thinking of how we're going to maintain everything financially. So we're thinking if we get a kitchen, then we'll be able to have other restaurants and we'll be able to take care of everybody. So how is he thinking? He's thinking this is Krishna's temple. These are all Krishna's devotees. And I'm taking care of them as my service to Krishna. Right? And also I want to preach on the word and make Maybe you should be sitting here giving the class. <laughs> Someday. Someday, may you be sitting here giving the class, okay? And I'll come and listen. So we can think this way also about our home. This is one of the reasons why in our own home we're enjoined to have an altar. Even if you just have pictures on your altar, that this is Krishna's temple. My home is Krishna's temple. My family members are also Krishna's devotees. You may say, well, my family members don't always act like Krishna's devotees. <laughs> but Jivara Swarupaya Krishnara Nichidasa, everybody is Krishna's servant. And if we think even my, I may have a family member that isn't acting right now as Krishna's servant. Still, these are all part and parcel of Krishna's, and they've been, and Krishna's given me these living entities to take care of. This building is Krishna's, these living entities are Krishna's, and I'm taking care of them like that. You know, you can be the temple president of your house or the temple commander of your house or the head of the, you know, like in the temple, we have the head pujari and we have the head of the kitchen, right? The treasurer, you know. So you, your house becomes a little temple. I'm, this is kind of an embarrassing story, but um, many, many, many years ago, my God, how many years ago? 36 years ago, Hare Krishna. So I had read something in the Sankirtan newsletter by one sannyasi saying that every time we hear a class, we should think, how can I apply this to my life? So I got really inspired. And I said, I'm going to do that. You know? So I went to class the next day. And the whole time I'm thinking, OK, how can I apply this to my life? Well, it was particularly challenging because uh, we were grahastas at the time. We were living down the street. And the person giving the class was the temple commander. And the entire class was about how if you really want to become Krishna conscious, you should just surrender to your authority in the temple. <clears throat> so I was a little bored in the class. 
I was thinking two things. I thought, okay, you're just telling everyone they should listen to you, which is exactly what he was doing. And I also thought, what does this have to do with me? You know, I come to the temple for the program, but I don't live in the temple. And at a certain point, I thought, all right, you know, you decided you want to apply to the class to yourself. You want to apply the class to yourself. You want to find some practical meaning in this class. What practical meaning can I find out of it? I thought, I don't have anyone here as my authority. My husband's my authority. And I'm like, oh, my husband is my temple president. And it, it just revolutionized my life. It was quite interesting. I mean, it was, it was a terrible Bhagavatam class. It was really bad. But it just revolu revolutionized my life. I thought, okay, this is a temple. My husband's the temple president. You know, and I was the temple commander. And then everything becomes service. Hmm? I mean, what's the difference between this temple and our home? Yes? Right? It's our consciousness. So Lord Chaitanya also said like this. He was telling the devotees, there's a whole story behind this about Gopinath Patanaika, which we will not tell that whole story now. But Mahaprabhu was saying, I don't want everyone to be a renunciate. I don't want everyone to be a renunciate. You know, the brahmacharis, the vanaprastas, and the sannyasis, they don't have any varna. Hmm? The varnas are Brahman, Satya, Vaishya, Sudra. Because that's how you earn your livelihood. And students, retired, and dead people don't earn livelihoods. Right? Uh, the brahmachari, of course, is being trained for a livelihood, Prabhupada says in the second canto. And the, the vanaprastha and the sannyasi, they've given up livelihood. Hmm? That means that especially the vanaprastha and the sannyasi, they're supposed to be only engaged in the nine items of bhakti. Of course, even vanaprastas and sannyasis do things like brush their teeth and wash their clothing. But Mahaprabhu was saying, I don't want everyone to be in the renounced ashram. I also need people dealing with things in the world. I need people managing the world. It's Krishna's world. He wants people to manage it. That's also a service. And this is a rather long slide, but this is a purport by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur on this principle. And he's saying, Bhakti Siddhanta is saying, both taking sannyas and dealings in pounds, shilling, and pence are external affairs. So sometimes we think, well, if I'm more externally renounced, then I'll be more Krishna conscious. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati is saying, no, they're both external. In any condition, one should always consider how to please and satisfy Krishna. Thus, even if one is involved in great material affairs, he will not become attached. So thinking, I'm Krishna's servant. How can I please Krishna? How can I please Krishna? How can I please Krishna? Generally in our life, we do things to try to impress somebody, yes? That's, everyone knows how to do that, right? Do you know how to do something and you're not really concerned about what you're doing, you're concerned about other, what other people will think about what you're doing? Does everyone know how to do that? Everyone's done that sometimes, yes? Right? I'm talking to you, but I'm not really interested in you. Someone else is watching and I want them to be impressed. Okay, everybody knows how to do that? So often with religion, we do it backwards. You know, we're worshiping Krishna, so everybody will watch us worshiping Krishna. And everybody will think, oh, they all think I'm so spiritual. So you, you want to do it the other way. You want to take care of the people and the things and the events in your life so Krishna will watch, and Krishna will think, what a nice devotee you are. Can we do that? Yes? Is Krishna here? Is he always with you? He's always watching. Right? If I'm trying to impress my neighbors, they might not always be watching. But Krishna's always watching. He's in the heart. He's in the heart. He's always watching. And to act in such a way that Krishna will smile. And this automatically spiritualizes everything. All right, how can I deal with my son so Krishna will smile? How can I deal with my boss so Krishna will smile? How can I deal with this you know, person in the shop so Krishna will smile? And if you want to know how to make Krishna smile, I suggest you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12. Text 13 to 20. This is one of my favorite, 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 favorite quotes. The letter to Jai Patakamarsh in 1972. The secret of surrendering to Krishna is that such surrendered devotee sees that everything is part of Krishna's plan. Whatever is meant to be, I am doing. So that sounds so new agey, huh? That's the kind of thing the new agey people say. You're always perfectly in the right place. You know, always perfectly in the right place. You're always doing what you're supposed to be doing. Rose says it's true. 
We're always doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We're always exactly in the right place. Hmm? We're always with exactly the right people. Sometimes someone comes to me and says, Oh, I'm so sorry I missed your class. It's like, well, you weren't meant to be there. <laughs> I, it gives you such a sense of peace. You can say, does this apply to everyone? Certainly. But especially someone who's dedicated their lives to the Lord. Someone who said, my dear Lord, from this day on, I am yours. Just please be assured that as long as you're based, following the basic process of Krishna consciousness, whatever is meant to be that I am doing. Such a peaceful thing. It, it, just, it relieves like 10 million tons of anxiety. Let me do it with my full attention to every detail. Let me become absorbed in such service Never mind what it is. So whether you're cleaning the floor, whether you're changing your baby's nappy, whether you're driving to work, whether you're dealing with a customer, whether you're putting on your socks, let all other considerations be forgotten and only my desire to do the best for Krishna's alone pleasure is my motive. So this is the same principle, is Krishna smiling? Is Krishna smiling? Is Krishna smiling? And if we forget, that's all right. Just remember again. You know, just like the child learning how to walk. Who here has watched a child learning how to walk? Who's watched a child learning how to walk? My goodness. I've never been in an audience where so few people raise their hand. Really? So few of you have seen a child learning how to walk? Are there no children in Australia anymore? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Generally, when I ask that, like 90% of people raise their hand. You guys got to get out there and, you know, have, see some kids in your life. So the way the kids learn how to walk is they stand up. First, they stand up holding on to something, okay? And then they try to stand up by themselves, and then they try to take a step. And while they're doing that, they do a lot of what? Anybody know what they're doing a whole lot of during this whole time? Falling. falling. They're doing a lot of falling, and they often get bruises. Hmm? So they're doing like 90% falling, 10% standing up. But the child and the adults around are never discouraged by the falling bits. You know, you'll never find that the, the husband says to his wife, you know, I'm really worried that Timmy's never going to walk because he just keeps falling. <laughs> you know, they, they call up all the aunties and the uncles and the grandmas and the grandpas and they say, you know, she took one step. <laughs> and nowadays they put it on video and put it on Facebook. Right? But that's, that's what it's like. So if, if one minute during the day you can think, oh, is Krishna smiling? You celebrate that. Like the child, if they stand up for one second, they celebrate it. And then the next day you try for two minutes. And the next day you try for five minutes. And eventually you want to get to the point where at every moment in the day we're thinking, is Krishna smiling? Is Krishna smiling? Is Krishna smiling? Is Krishna pleased with how I'm behaving? And if, again, if you say, well, I haven't the foggiest notion of what would make Krishna smile, then Bhagavad Gita 12, 13 through 20, Krishna says what makes him smile. Also explains this nightly in uh, Bhagavad Gita chapter 16, text 1 through 3, and 13, uh, 5 through 8, and other verses scattered hither and thither. So then we're going to look at leading a pure life. The pressure to do sinful things that comes from the people we work with, our family members, other students we go to school with, and even perhaps ourself. And this is it's, it's quite a problem. It's really quite a problem. We are all naturally social beings, and we naturally want to be liked by others. We naturally want to get along with others. Uh, we don't like to be very different. I was just uh, reading a little essay my daughter wrote as she's filling out some forms for some research that a student's doing in Bhaktivedanta College. And she was writing about how difficult it was for her growing up as a devotee, going out in public with Tilak and, you know, having people stare at her and, oh, you're so different. There was um, a time that I was working as an assistant principal, I don't know if you call them principals or head teachers, you call them principals, oh, I use the American term. So I was working as an assistant principal in a government school, like 450 kids, and I was there completely undercover, it was in a very Christian area, and if they had known I was a devotee, I would have lost my job. So it was, it was a kind of tricky situation for me, and it was really the only time I've ever been in that kind of a situation. 
So I would go into each classroom every day to check up on all of the teachers. That was part of my job. And uh, one time when I was in one classroom, they were having a little break, and the students were eating a snack. And I remember one of the assistant teachers was in the classroom, not the teacher. And I was kind of sitting on the side of the classroom. I was sitting on a desk. And the assistant teacher was going around as the kids were eating stuff, and she was asking them, so what's your favorite restaurant? What's your favorite restaurant? And as she said this, I had a desire. You've got to be careful about desires. You know that, right? You all know that you have to be careful what you desire? Do you all know that? Okay. So I had a desire. My desire was, I wonder what it would feel like to be a devotee child in this classroom. That was my desire. And after, as soon as I had that desire, I forgot that I had that desire. Has that ever happened to you? You had a desire and then it kind of just kind of came in your mind and then it went away? Okay. So I forgot. So the teacher's asking, what's your favorite restaurant? And they're all saying, and all of a sudden I had this thought, I hope she doesn't ask me. <laughs> now, remember, I'm the assistant principal, okay? Right? You know, I was, I was one of the, this is just an assistant teacher in the classroom, and I'm one of the administrators, one of the top administrators in the school of 450 people. And all of a sudden, here I am as an administrator worrying about this assistant teacher asking me a question. I hope she doesn't ask me. I hope she doesn't ask me. And, and this was in a place where there was no Govinda's restaurant. You know, there was, there was... And then, of course, the assistant teacher does turn to me and says, so, what's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> and I kind of felt like I was folding into myself. And I said, um, I don't eat at restaurants. And the kids in the class, and remember, I'm one of the administrators in the school. The kids were about maybe 11, 12 years old. And they looked at each other and went, ew, that's so weird. <laughs> uh, they generally wouldn't act like that toward one of the school principals, you know? And I felt just awful. I mean, I, I was just kind of like wondering if I could sort of go under the desk. And then the assistant teacher again said, why don't you eat at any restaurants? Just like that. And uh, I said, well, um, I'm really concerned about the consciousness of, of the food. And the kids look at each other and go, ew, that's so weird. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm just sort of like, <laughs> I said, well, my father used to run a food business, and I saw a lot of the people in the factory. They didn't have very good consciousness. I used to work in a restaurant, and I don't really like to eat that kind of food. I mean, you see me, am I like a really unconfident kind of person? No, okay, so I was really, I was just like, what a, get me out of this place. And the kids were again going, that's, that's the strangest thing I ever heard. Have you ever heard anything like that? Ew, you know? And finally, I kind of slunk out of the classroom, and I'm walking down the hall, and for the next 10 minutes, I felt really embarrassed. I was like, you know, why do I have to be a devotee and have all these strange food habits, and everybody's making fun of me? And then a part of me was going, what is wrong with you? You've been a devotee for a long time, you know? Didn't you get over this, like, way back in the 1970s? What is your problem? And then another part of me was like, Oh, this is terrible. You know, all these people are making fun of me. And after 10 minutes of that, Super Soul said, what you asked. <laughs> and I went, oh. So there's this kind of pressure out there in the world. You know, I mean, we send our children to the outside schools. What they have to go through just about what they eat. Hmm? What to speak about anything else. And what it's like, of course, in the workplace. I mean, I even went through this as, as a as an employee there, I one time that we had a, what do you call it, a school meeting where we couldn't bring our own food, and so I just said, okay, I'll take some salad, and the, my boss, the principal, said to me, so why are you a vegetarian anyway? So there's this sort of pressure all the time, what to speak of believing in God and not going to the bar and things like that. It's a real problem to try to maintain your, your principles in the modern world. So, of course, one solution is to have a higher taste, right? We have, here's this, a, I don't know how well you can see this. Oh, it's a good projector. So here you can see, right, all of the Russes in the spiritual world, they have their counterpart in the material world.
So instead of trying to enjoy the things of this world, uh, we get our pleasure from Krishna. Prabhupada says in Nectar Devotion that whatever anyone's trying to do, they're trying to enjoy some sort of rasa. That it's the pleasure in some activity that drives us on and on to do that activity. And we are pleasure-seeking. We are Nandamaya Biasat. We cannot live without pleasure. It's not possible. If you just say, I'm not going to engage in material pleasures, it won't work. It just won't work. We'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. But one has to really find some spiritual pleasure. If you just engage in Krishna consciousness in a mechanical way as your religion, it's not going to make it. We really, there's a nice book that David Richamarish has about, called Bhakti Bhava, about uh, engaging one's emotions in Krishna consciousness. I, I really recommend that book. It's really excellent. So getting some higher taste. Then, I, this is a very important point that I think perhaps at least some of us don't understand. Srila Prabhupada talks about in Bhagavad Gita 247, three kinds of work we do in this world. Routine work, emergency work, and desired activities. So our desired activities means things like hobbies. Our routine work, our regular job, taking care of our family, our body, and so on. Emergency work, which please have it just be for emergencies. Sometimes people live in an emergency mode. So our ordinary work should be according to our nature, according to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And we should also do fun things for Krishna. We should do fun things for Krishna that we really like to do. One of the items of devotional service, one of the 64 items, is offering Krishna a favorite object. So find something we like to do, Krishna, not something that you have to do. Uh, I've been an editor for Back to Godhead for like 25 years. That's not, it's, just some, it's like a hobby. It's something that I like to do. You know, maybe you grow a garden. Maybe you make the garlands. Maybe you come and make the giwigs. Maybe you produce a newsletter. You know, find something for Krishna that you like to do that can become your hobby. And then Krishna also says that everyone has to have some recreation, recreation. Hmm? Sometimes we think that devotees shouldn't have any kind of recreation. Well, Krishna says you should have some recreation. Make your recreation Krishna conscious. Do something for recreation that also aids you spiritually. So some Krishna conscious hobbies that you like, some Krishna conscious recreation. These things go a long way towards keeping us from activities that pull us down into material life. Then have your life full of association with the devotees. I mean, we, we have to have some dealings with people outside of devotees. In fact, it's actually unhealthy for an organization if all the members only associate with each other. It's all, it's, it, I mean, seriously. It, it, it creates what's called a closed environment, those of you who study organizational theory. And the organization, after a while, will, will stagnate and die. So you want to have some association with people outside. And in fact, as a preaching movement, we're all enjoying to have some association with non-devotees. But our intimate friends should be devotees. If, we, if our intimate friends are all materialistic people, that's also going to drag us down into sinful activities. And if you have to, make up some excuses. Say, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm allergic to alcohol or something like that. You know, just make up some kind of story. And then to choose an occupation that doesn't involve sin. Now, I found that for some people, this is really a test of faith. I mean, for some people, it's really a test of faith. I have met devotees who make their living advertising cigarettes. I have met devotees who make their living being a cashier in a gambling casino. I've met devotees make their living as day traders, which is definitely gambling. Not all investments are gambling, but day trading is definitely gambling. So I've met devotees who make their living in some kind of a sinful environment. I met devotees who work in a restaurant where they sell fish. And when you say to these people, this is not very good for your spiritual life, they say, well, how else will I live? Or sometimes it's not that the occupation itself directly involves sin, but you're expected to engage in sinful activities in that occupation. There are certain jobs where you're expected to go out drinking alcohol with the clients. And there, there are just certain jobs where that's a very high expectation. If you don't do those things, 
is considered that there's something wrong with you. So this purport in Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulila 24, 257 is, I think, one of the most important and ins inspiring and faith-building instructions that we have. This is in regard to the story of Magrari the hunter. That Magrari the hunter was living by selling animal skins. And not only did he kill the animals, but he'd kill them very slowly and in a way that was very painful for them. So Narada Muni, when he met Magrari, told him, first of all, he said, why don't you just kill the animals more quickly? That was the first thing he said. And then when he showed Magrari how he was going to suffer for killing animals altogether, Magrari became afraid. And he said, please save me from my sinful reactions. And Narada Muni said, all right, I will save you, but first you have to throw away your bow. And there's a, we could talk about that for a long time, how first you have to jump before you know how you're going to get caught. When we say to Krishna, first you have to tell me what will happen when I give up my attachment and then I'll give it up, it'll never happen. That's another discussion. But it has to be first I'll give up my attachment. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to give it up anyway. And Krishna always catches you. Anyway, so Narada Muni said to Magari, first get rid of your bow. And Magari said, how will I live? How will I live? And so Srila Prabhupada has this wonderful purport. He says, the source of our income is not actually the source of our maintenance. Every living being from the great Brahma down to an insignificant ant is being maintained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Our so-called source of income is our choice only. Also in this purport, Prabhupada says, if you want to live as a Brahmana, you'll be maintained by being a Brahmana. If you want to live as a hunter, you'll be maintained by being a hunter. It's simply our choice. We have already a destiny of how comfortably we're going to live. That destiny is based primarily on how charitable we were in our previous life and in this life. If we use money only for ourselves, we don't get very much of it. If we use money for the good of others, we're given more. Isn't that reasonable? Right? If you had a child who just took all the cookies and ate them themselves, you wouldn't give them very many. And if the child shared with his brothers and sisters, you'd give him more. Correct? Yes? So this is how Krishna distributes wealth. By the way, this doesn't just mean cash. This means a general standard of living. There's plenty of people out in the world who make a lot of money in cash, and they never have enough money. <laughs> I've met people like this. Their, their cash income is huge, and they're just always poor. They're always in debt. They're always struggling. And you meet other people who have a lesser cash income, and they have a nice standard of living. So we're talking here about standard of living. Our standard of living, our comfort level in life, that's already set according to our piety. You cannot increase or decrease that by working harder or working a different job. It just doesn't work. It's not going to happen. Okay, if you say this job, I'll make more money, you'll make more money, but if you're not destined to live more comfortably, Krishna will take it away. Prabhupada says Krishna has ten hands. If he wants to give you, he can give you more than you can hold, and if he wants to take, you can't hold on to it. And Krishna has many ways both to take and to give. So there's no point in doing something, in doing work that's sinful just to make money. Whatever money, whatever comfort you're going to have, you're going to have. So you can choose what's your source of income and then know that Krishna is maintaining you. And actually, we're all working for Krishna anyway. Aren't we all working to make Krishna smile? Yes, we're working for him. So he's the one who's going to maintain us. Okay, now we're going to look at a really big area, priorities and time management. And this is a big one we get complaints about. I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to chant 16 rounds. I don't have enough time to read Prabhupada's books. I don't have enough time to go to the temple. I don't have enough time to do any service. I don't have enough time. Blah, 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 blah. Maybe someday when I'm 85, I'll have enough time. <laughs> of course, then you'll be going to the doctor all day. So, yeah, sorry, Krishna. So Prabhupada says, one who has this human form of life should not work hard all day and night. Not like the animals, you know, like the elephants. All day they're eating. All day they're eating. Just eating, 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 eating. That's not our life. You know, or some little creature like the seahorse. They don't have any stomach. They have to eat constantly. But that's not what's meant to be our life as human beings. Just working, 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 working. Prabhupada says, work at most eight hours a day. So I knew one devotee, he had three houses. 
Only one wife, though. I don't know why you need three houses. I, I'm not disturbed by the children. You don't need to take you don't need to take the children out if you want to. Okay. Not bothering. Me. So he had three houses, he had three jobs. He was working, you know, like 85, 90 hours a week. I said, why are you working so hard? He said, for my kids. I said, do you ever see them? <laughs> Prabhupada tells a story how about in India that there was one family where the husband would leave for work before the child woke up in the morning and go to sleep, come back after the child was sleeping. And Prabhupada said he was there when the child was about three years old. He saw his father and he said, mommy, who is that man? And this is, again, the same principle. Whatever we're going to get, we're going to get. An honest living, eight hours a day. So if you do something dishonest or sinful, or you work more than eight hours a day, you may get more in terms of cash, but you're not going to get more in terms of happiness. We're not going to be able to increase our, our material happiness and our standard of life and our comfort of living. It's not going to happen. And you could say, well, I'm not working hard, you know, 10 hours a day because I want to make money. I'm working hard because I'm so important. I have so many important things to do. And we may think this way even if it's not a job that we're doing. You know, somebody even running around at the temple doing 10,000 things and not getting their rounds done. But I'm so important. So how important are we? How important is all the things that we're doing? Who here knows all the names of their great-great-grandparents? Who knows all the names of their great-great-grandparents? That means that our great-great-grandchildren, the grandchildren of our grandchildren, will not know our names. <laughs> no. They won't. Maybe if you put your name up on a plaque somewhere. Uh, uh, they certainly won't care about what we did. And that's our own family. It's our own family. I just speak of anybody else. You know, when we die, we're going to get just a couple sentences in the newspaper. And if you're really, 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 really important, my father was a big, important man. He had got five paragraphs in the New York Times. So that's for your whole life. Your whole life gets distilled down to five paragraphs. You know, if you're a really big person, the Hare Krishna movement will give you a 2,500-word essay in Back to Godhead. That's your whole life. You know, and, and you can even experiment today, you know, or tomorrow. Find somebody who really loves you. I mean, a, a genuine a really close friend, and say, would you please listen to me for one hour while I recount to you everything I did today? Try it. <laughs> you know, but it's so important that we have to sacrifice our spiritual life for it. It's so important. I have to do so many things, put in so many hours, that I have no time to be with God. And some practical things. And Prabhupada talks about that when he was a householder, he chanted 16 rounds in increments of four rounds. So four rounds before eating, four rounds before going to bed. He said, if you do it like that, you'll be sure to get your rounds done. Then to work with our own situation. Sometimes people say, well, Ermila, what did you do? I said, what does it matter what I did or what I do? You have to find something that works for you. You know, you can get ideas from other people. How did they chant their rounds? How did they get their deity worship done? But you've still got to work out something that's going to work for you and your situation, your health, your job, your family, your needs, your personality. We're all individuals. Please don't try to just copy-paste someone else's situation into your life. And then when it doesn't work out, you say, okay, I can't do it. It's not going to work. Then in your own life, be creative and flexible. For example, you can now get, and, and, and all of us here are very, very fortunate that we speak and understand English. I, th I think it's sometimes hard to appreciate how fortunate we are to know English because all of Srila Prabhupada's books are in English. I mean, I was just in Indonesia. We've had our movement in Indonesia since the 70s. 
And they only have the Bhagavatam translated up to the sixth canto, and they only have Adi Lila of the Chaitanya Charitamrita translated. I mean, just imagine if you didn't even have access to the whole Bhagavatam and the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita after having been a devotee for like 35 years. Most of the people there don't speak English. And not only can we read all the books in English, but we have many different devotees who've recorded the books as audiobooks. And I know many people who, instead of just reading, they listen to the books. I was just staying uh, with some devotees in Brisbane that when they dress their deities in the morning, they're listening to Bhagavatam as an audiobook. I know one other devotee, when he would be working, driving to and from work, he had a job that required a lot of driving, he'd be listening to Chaitanya Charitamrita as an audiobook. I know one devotee who, while she was getting her um, PhD, she was listening to the Bhagavad Gita as an audiobook. She said she just listened to it constantly, and she ended up memorizing the whole Bhagavad Gita. So be creative, be flexible. You know, you can also have the books now on your phone, yes? I mean, that's easy. You can say, okay, I'm going to read one screen before breakfast, one screen before lunch, one screen before dinner, one screen before I go to bed. Right? Make sense? Okay. You can have the audio books on your phone. You can have the books themselves on your phone. I find some creative solutions whereby you can integrate your basic Krishna conscious sadhana into your life. And then different solutions at different times. You know, what works for you when you're 25 may not work for you when you're 55. The way you do your sadhana when you have a two-year-old kid in the house may not be the same as when you don't have any kids in the house. Do you all follow? Yes? So not only are we going to have different solutions than other people, we're going to have different solutions at different times in our lives. And then this next point is very similar to find some hobby or desire that you can use, desired activity you can use in Krishna's service. Do something that's spiritually enlivening for you. This is a very important principle that Srila Prabhupada talks about several times. He talks about it in the Nectar Devotion in regard to the 64 Angas of Bhakti. Yes, okay, we all have our minimum. Everyone minimum 16 rounds. Everyone minimum reading Bhagavatam every day. Everyone minimum engaging in some deity worship every day. Beyond that minimum that everybody should do, do what's enlivening for you. Or I had one devotee come to me and say, it's so hard for me to read Srila Prabhupada's books. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just can't read them. And I said, well, what have you done? She said, well, I thought I have to first read Bhagavad Gita, then, Bhag then Bhagavatam, then Chaitanya Charitamrita, but I just can't even get through the Bhagavad Gita. And I said, well, there are any of Prabhupada's books that you really like? Oh, I love the Nectar Devotion. I said, well, just read that. She said, well, I'm, I thought I can't read it first. I said, what's better? <laughs> to think you have to read the Bhagavad Gita first and read nothing? Or to read the Nectar Devotion and read something? And Prabhupada would say, just one line in, in his books, you can attain perfection. Do what you like to do. Find some, one of the 64 angas of bhakti that you really enjoy. And do that daily, whatever it may be. You know, something that, that you look forward to. Oh, when can I do that? When can I do that? When can I do that? I, mean, I know one devotee who her favorite thing is decorating her altar with flowers. She just loves to do that, to grow flowers and pick flowers and decorate her altar with flowers. And then you can be meditating that, on that all day. And you're going to be likely to do it because you enjoy it. Hmm? Then prioritize, right? I, I wish I had a video of this. I looked all over, couldn't find one. If anybody can find one, please let me know. But you can take a, a glass, and in a glass, if you want to put in rocks, pebbles, sand, and water... If you try to put in the water first, it's hard to fill anything else in there. But if you put the big rocks in first, then there's room for the little rocks, room for the sand, and room for the water. And again, I wish I had a video because it's, it's very powerful to see this. Do what's most important first. Put Krishna first. Remember that all the things we think in life that are so important are not very important. They're not even very important to us. I mean, would you really want to read a diary from your last life of every single thing that you did? You know, or even from yesterday or last week. I mean, all these so important things are not even very important to us, what to speak of to anyone else, what to speak of to the universe. The whole universe is going to go on just fine. I mean, you find that when you get sick, huh? The life just sort of goes on. The world doesn't stop spinning. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
put Krishna first. Put Krishna first. And Krishna is going to be my priority. Spending my time with Krishna, chanting Krishna's names, reading the books, offering my food to Krishna. It may be something simple, but put Krishna first. And then you'll actually find you have more time for everything else. Whereas if you want to get everything else done first, you may have no time for Krishna at all. Okay. We're going to summarize. Good teachers summarize. Krishna summarizes. Krishna does Kaviraj summarizes. All right, so we're looking at the four areas. The first one is whether or not I see Krishna in the world. Do I have transcendental vision? This comes from dedicating everything to Krishna and seeing Krishna both in the material energy and remembering Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes. Having things in the material energy remind me of Krishna, either as he talks about in the Bhagavad Gita, light of the sun and the moon, etc., or reminding me of his direct pastimes and forms. So as not to have this distinction that, okay, this is my spiritual life and this is my material life. See that everything I have, my home, my body, my family, everything belongs to Krishna. This is my service to Krishna. And I will do it with great attention to every detail just to get Krishna's smile. To deal with temptations, to do things that drag us down from bhakti, to get some real spiritual enjoyment, spiritual emotion, to have devotee friends, to do things in Krishna's service that we enjoy, to have spiritual recreation, make up excuses if we absolutely have to, and perhaps change our job. As far as having time and prioritizing, uh, to work only eight hours at most at, an, at honest work, put Krishna first, be creative, uh, find our own solutions. So questions, comments, additions, subtractions, chastisements, etc. We could have the lights on, please. Lights on, please. Yes. Before when we church, and we are showing the steam sun, we have to remember the one thing that we showed that like a storm, the whole trees are moving. How do you do Krishna with it? How do you do Krishna with what? I've seen those trees. Oh, the trees. Because uh, Krishna says, a purifier is I am the wind. Yeah, strong wind. A strong wind, yes. Okay, any other question? Yes. Uh, what are you saying uh, doing a proper job, sinless job? But if you see to the scenario, directly or indirectly, all the jobs are interlinked, and somewhere or other you're supporting the bad industry, maybe directly or indirectly. Okay, that's true, but that's not an excuse to do it overtly and, and intensely. I mean, I'm sure that all of us are indirectly in some way contributing to the slaughterhouse industry, for sure. Unless you make all of your own products and you're growing everything in your own yard, you know? I mean, unless you're producing everything, I'm sure there's some ingredient in something that you're using somewhere that has some connection to the slaughterhouse industry. How are you going to avoid it? You know, are you going to look at all the glue in all the cardboard boxes that you get? You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean you should go out yourself and take an ax and cut off a cow's head. So just, just because, you know, Prabhupada was, was asked about, you know, if there's World War III, then there's going to be atomic radiation. And Prabhupada said, the whole world is polluted. We live here. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you guys, you know, put radiation in your house. So I, I think it's the, the fact that it is impossible to be 100% free from sin in the Kali Yuga and external ways doesn't, doesn't mean that I should be a cashier in a casino. Yes, Prabhu. Um, working, let's say, for some eight hours a day in a job, um, <coughs> employers seem to be more and more demanding of uh, the employees as time goes on. And um, it's sort of the forcing people to really want to sort of have to check the mentality of the job that you're in, uh, whether mm. it's good, good or bad. And so you really sort of end up being focused on this job. Mm -hmm. um, it might even be something good, it might be more of goodness, but it's still 
you sort of become that job to be able to do it, and to um, to be you know that just sort of that's like a big part of the day. It sort of seems to maybe take a person away from Christian consciousness. I know. You've so then you just have to ask yourself: Is it worth it? You have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Because, again, you know, what, why are we working? We're working, first of all, to maintain ourselves. But that's our destiny. Prabhupada says it's a question of your choice. So if you're working in a situation that you feel is dragging you away from Krishna, then you can choose to do something else. And the other reason that we may work at a certain job is it may satisfy some psychological need of ours. It may be something that's in line with our psychophysical nature. But again, you know, you're, you're really the only one who can say, because not, nothing is perfect. Krishna says everything has some fault, just like smoke is covering fire. You're not going to find any situation in this world that is perfectly, totally, absolutely suited to becoming Krishna conscious. That's not possible. Abrahma, Bhuvana, Loka. There's going to be some material fault in everything, even if you live in the temple there'll be some annoying other temple resident or something like that. I mean, there just will be. So if, if you think, well, I'm going to, you know, find the perfect situation, and when I find the perfect situation, then I'll be Krishna conscious, that's not the solution either. And you have to just see, you know, what's the trade-off? Is it really, um, is, it, is it something that's just a minor inconvenience that can be tolerated, or is it something that's really impeding my spiritual life? Is that all right? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, when you mentioned, uh, when we talk about uh, recreation or hobby, is it something that's strictly maybe service-related, or is it just recreational activity which well, service is anything that helps you think of Krishna. Service doesn't have to be with your hands and legs. So, you know, Prabhupada, you know what Prabhupada said his own spiritual recreation was? Singing bhajans. Prabhupada said whenever there's a gap and I have nothing to do, then I take out my harmonium and I have a bhajan. So it was, there was nobody else in the room. Hmm? So that was his recreation. I'm sure he had other recreations too, but that was his recreation. So something that, um, something that is somehow connected with Krishna. Is that all right? Yes. Um, maybe not directly to the lecture, but how to get rid of fear, maybe insecurity of job or Maybe you have to keep updating yourself and then you find out that, oh, I have to read on fear stuff and then my... Fear is, is, the, is really the, the big problem in general. The fear that Krishna won't take care of me or fear that Krishna doesn't really love me or fear that Krishna consciousness won't really work. Or, you know, it's, 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 we're all, it's all fear and the opposite of, of fear. What's the opposite of fear? Give me some... Courage. Love, courage, courage. faith. What else? Peace? Empowerment. Hmm? Empowerment. Okay. So the main thing is you think, what do I want instead? Pick whichever one of those work for you. Courage, peace, faith, love, empowerment. And then how am I going to get that? That becomes the question. So how do you get courage? And how do you get faith, which are very, very related? You act in faith. As I said, you, you jump first. You always have to jump first. I'm sorry. This is how it works. It doesn't work by saying, okay, Krishna, show me exactly what's going to happen when I jump, and then I'll jump. I mean, you can get some idea by looking at other devotees, but you, know, that, that's some, you can get some. You know, well, that person jumped, and they're, they're okay. In fact, they look pretty happy. So, you know, but... Usually you just have to jump. And if you're really scared, you can just take a little teeny tiny jump. And then Krishna catches you and you say, well, that was nice. Pratyaksha Bhagavan Dhamma, experience. So take a little jump. And you see, it's, it's nice. And then you can take a little bigger one. 
And you see, it's nice. Take a little bigger one. And then pretty soon you're ready to fly. Yes, somebody over here. Yes. Um, is that a job predetermined? Is it no. destiny? No. You said our wealth was predetermined. Our, our standard of living, our comfort level in life is predetermined. But this, your specific job is not known. Prabhu said it's a matter, that's a matter of your choice. Yes. Hi. In, in line with fear and anxiety, what if um, we have cultivated um, uh, faith, you know, and the spirit okay. and mood of surrender, but uh, the people around you, especially significant others, you know, who, who like, who love you, like family and friends. Mm -hmm. They're all filled they, with fear. They impose their fear and anxiety. And the Bhagavatam in the seventh canto says that you just say yes, 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 and then do whatever you want. <laughs> That's what it says in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's Narada Muni. You can thank him. He said that. Yes. Thank you, Krishna says, Gita, all times think of me and do your duty. Yes. But there are a lot of situations in the workplace where you know, push up this. It's common to a lot of people. Uh, where a lot of situations in the workplace? The workplace where you encounter stressful situations. Yes. It, uh, you know, uh, when you're dealing with uh, your, your boss or your colleagues, or could even be situations which could really stress you off. So under such scenarios, how do you really apply the worst? Ah, OK. Well, have you ever wanted to be a secret agent? So you can be a secret agent, okay? We, 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 don't, we no longer work for the bank. We no longer work for the government. We no longer work for whatever you work for. Sarvapati vanir muktan tat paratena nirmala rishikesha rishikena sevena bhakti ruchite. So I am no longer a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, an Indian, an Australian, uh, old or young, I'm no longer an investment banker, I'm no longer a flower arranger or a teacher or whatever in the world you are. I work for Krishna's company. I'm Krishna's employee. He pays my salary, which is the truth. Yes? Okay. What's the product that Krishna's company sells? What's their product? Mm -hmm. oh, well, holy name is, yeah, but... Love. Love. This is the Love of God company. That's the product, this Love of God. Nice product. Little intangible, but it's a nice product. So we're, you sign up to be an employee in the Love of God company. All right? But the problem is you're going into enemy territory. Okay? You're going, you're going into the selfish, I'm at the center, lust territory. So you have to go undercover. That if you just go out and say, I'm here selling Love of God. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't even work very well with religious people. It doesn't even work very well with the other devotees in the Hare Krishna movement. It doesn't. You usually have to have some other thing that you, that you appear to be promoting. Sorry, it's just what it is. So what to speak of when you're in the world in general, you have to have a cover. Just like, you know, if you want to be a spy for the Australian government in Russia or something, or wherever your enemies are, in Syria or something, you can't just go in there and say, hi, I'm a spy for the Australian government, you know. You have to have to do something. You have to be selling cars, or you have to be a... I know some devotees who are college professors in a communist country, for example. They don't care about being college professors. That's their cover. So all the things we're doing, being a husband, being a father, being a wife, being a mother, being a daughter and a son and a citizen, that's just to cover. We're not any of those things. Sarvapati vinir muktam. Now, everybody you then encounter in your family, in your job, on the street, whatever, who are they? So some of those people are co-workers in Krishna's Love of God company. Sometimes you encounter other co-workers in Krishna's Love of God company. And you're really lucky if, you know, your husband or your wife also happens to be a co-worker in the Love of God company. Then, you, you know, you won the spiritual lottery. Right? And some of the people you work with, they're suppliers of Love of God in the Love of God company. 
Some of them are your vendors. Some are your customers. Some are potential customers. And everyone you work with is in one of those categories. And that's how you see them. These people at work, I, I don't really have a job as a whatever, fill in the blank. I really, I'm, this is my cover. I'm a secret agent in Krishna's Love of God company. And this other person at work now, who are they? Are they a coworker in the company? Are they a supplier? Are they a customer? Or are they a potential customer? Maybe right now they shop at the Illusion Lust store. Right? Now, how am I going to behave with these people within my cover to sell some love of God? Do you like challenges? Well, that's the challenge. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Then life is transformed. How can I somehow, what can I do? What can I do to distribute love of God to this potential customer? Like, you know those post-it notes everybody uses now? It's one of the, one of the five top office supplies that sell in the world. So when they were first developed, first of all, it took years for 3M to develop them because nobody could figure out what, what in the world you'd use that adhesive for. What do you use a not very sticky adhesive for? You know, it took them a long time to think of a commercial use for it. Anyway, when they finally developed them, they put them in the stores. Nobody bought them. And then what they did was gave out free samples. And as soon as they gave out free samples, there was a 90% rebuy rate. So, you know, if you want to go to potential customers, you may have to give them a free sample. How do you do that practically? Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, text 13 through 20. Chapter 16, text 1 through 3. Those are your guidelines. How to be a secret agent. By Gita, chapter 12, text 13 through 20, 16, 1 through 3. How do you act as a secret agent? Anybody else? Yes. When you mentioned... Um, jumping, what, what does that mean? He said, if you jump, there's no catch. You're taking a risk. He's talking about fear. So I'm really afraid. I have this job. I know it's bad for my spiritual life for whatever reason. You know, pick one of 20 reasons, whatever it is. I know it's really bad for my spiritual life. I'm terrified that if I were to take some action, I'll be poor. I might be completely poor. I might lose everything. And then my family will reject me because I'm completely poor. They'll throw me on the street. And none of the other devotees will talk to me. None of my friends will, will take me in. I'll just be on the street and, and I'll have to eat out of garbage cans. And then I'll probably get really sick because I'm eating out of garbage cans. And I'll become malnourished. And I probably won't be able to walk anymore. And I'll be in a wheelchair. And I'll be... Paralyzed. You know, I'm trying to eat out of the garbage cans when I'm paralyzed and I won't have any friends. <laughs> so I have to keep the job. That's what it is, you know, that's what we're afraid of. We're afraid that we're gonna be poverty stricken and sick and abandoned. Yes, that's our that's the big fear. I'm gonna lose all my abilities, I'm gonna be in pain, I'm gonna lose all my friends, and I'm gonna be abandoned on the street. And sometimes we see people like that, and we think, might happen to me. <laughs> so sometimes you have to take this leap of faith and say, this thing is really bad for my spiritual life, and Krishna is the most important thing in my spiritual life, and therefore I am going to risk making some change in this. Like I talked to one man who told me, he said, my wife told me, that if I chant Hare Krishna in the house, she's going to leave me. And I have to choose either her or chanting my japa. And I said, I'm sorry, she's not allowed to give you that choice. I said, she doesn't have the right to give you that choice. And you can say to her, my dear wife, I choose you and japa. 
You can choose what you like, but I choose you and Jabba. I said, have the courage to say that. So that takes courage. You don't know what's going to happen. And Maya says, oh, kinds of terrible things will happen. <laughs> and you take a risk and jump. And Krishna will catch you, and those terrible things won't happen. And even if they do happen, it's okay. Krishna will catch you, and you'll be in Krishna's hands, and it'll be okay. And you don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know. Prabhupada tells the story in India of, of um, one company where everybody was coming, the workers were coming in wearing tilak, and then the boss says, I don't, anybody who comes in wearing tilak will be fired. You heard this? And so the next day, nobody wore tilak except one man. He wore tilak. And the boss said, okay, you can wear tilak. And maybe something terrible will happen, you know. Maybe you'll lose your job. Maybe you'll lose your friends. For Lord Maharaj, I mean, his father tried to kill him. It could be. It's not some guarantee that on the material level, terrible things won't happen. But terrible things happen to people who aren't devotees, too, you know. It's not like only people who take risks for Krishna have terrible things happen to them. People who don't take any risks for Krishna, their house burns down and their husband leaves them and their boss fires them and, you know, right? It's not that if I don't surrender to Krishna, I'm going to be able to control my life and I'm going to be able to control everything to make sure that I always live in a mansion with 10,000 adoring people. You know, it's not like that. So it takes some risk. Okay, we think we need to end now. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada. Ki Jai. Yeah.